So good after again, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, having me today. Uh, this app, this uh, lecture in uh, for this afternoon, I called it um, contract administration or contract admin one one. As you may have been anticipated from the title, this will be an introductory lecture about contract uh, administration, especially with a special focus on construction contracts. And at the end of this session, all attendees are expected to have gained an awareness uh, in so far as the clauses, which concerns uh, variations, extensions of time, and liquidated damages. Uh, again, uh, uh, I would like to thank Joe Phil and uh, Jet for having me today. And uh, before we begin, although um, it has been said earlier, uh, I would allow me to introduce myself. Again, I am Jose Carlo Padilla. I'm coming to you all the way from Singapore and I bring with me more than 10 years of experience in the construction industry with involvement in projects that ranges from uh, development of residential and commercial and uh, civil engineering projects. I have a bachelor's degree in civil engineering uh, from the Philippines and master of laws in construction law and arbitration from the United Kingdom. I am a member of several professional organizations such as the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors and Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Both of them are in the United Kingdom. And in the Philippines, I am a member of the Philippine Institute of Certified Quantity Surveyors and a registered professional civil engineer under the Professional Regulation Commission. So my areas of expertise are procurement of construction works, contract administration and management, construction law, and dispute resolution, among others. So uh, before I, I begin, uh, allow me to read to you my disclaimer. Uh, the issues discussed in this lecture and all statements made herein are the opinion of the speaker. Uh, and shall not be and must not be construed as uh, legal advice. Should you need advice on a specific issue, please seek the advice of your legal counsel. So at the end of the presentation, there will be a question and answer part where you can ask your questions or if you need clarifications on the issues that we will be discussing today. All questions or clarifications will be answered at the end of the presentation, so ask not to avoid uh, or uh, so as to avoid disruption of the discussion for today, right? So we begin with the question, what is contract administration and why is it important? Contract administration is the management of a contract, in this case, a construction contract to ensure that the obligations of the parties are performed and their rights under the contract are preserved. A proper administration of the contract will lead to avoidance of disputes and by extension, will lead to the timely completion of the project. Because of the broad scope of contract administration, I will be only covering three topics for today, uh, which uh, are the most common sources of disputes. These are variations, uh, extension of time clauses, and liquidated damages clauses. So before we begin, let's look at disputes around the globe and the common reasons why they arise. According to a study conducted by Arcadis in 2021, the amount of global disputes that is handled by them uh, around the globe is amounting to 54.6 million US dollars. And among the most common areas of disputes or causes of disputes is the parties, meaning the client, the contractor or subcontractors failure to understand and to comply with their contractual obligations. This emphasizes the need for a proper administration of the construction contract. Because if a contract is administered correctly, disputes can be ultimately avoided. So in this lecture, as I have said earlier, we will be discussing the three main focus or the three main uh, issues that gives rise uh, to uh, uh, that gives rise to the disputes. But first, let us discuss what is a construction contract. So, a construction contract can be defined in a number of ways. Uh, generally, a construction contract is an agreement between the employer or the client and the contractor, where the latter agrees to supply the materials and labor for the construction of a defined scope of work. And in return, the former, which is the employer, agrees to pay the contractor with the 
specified or ascertainable price. What makes a construction contract unique from other contracts is that it allows a third party, a party who is not interested in the agreement, to manage and administer the contract. We call that the contract administrator. So generally, third parties does not have rights to enforce any term or terms in the contract. In some instances, the contract administrator or the contract administrator is uh, employed uh, by the employer uh, and he will be, or the contract, uh, the contract administrator will be responsible for the proper administration of the contract and act as the employer's agent. Uh, and in several circumstances, uh, the contractor undertakes uh, the design responsibility in what we call the design and build contract and the other uh, where the other form which is the employer uh, maintains the risk of the design of the works and that we call a traditional procurement both of those uh, contracts are uh, administered by a contract administrator so in the philippines a construction contract falls in the general category of a contract as provided in article 1713 of the civil code of the philippines which provides and i quote uh, the contract for a piece of work where the contractor binds himself to execute a piece of work for the employer in consideration of a certain price or compensation the contractor may either employ uh, only his labor or skill or also furnish the material and code okay. so as we can see James, from engineer yes? James, sir excuse yeah, me hello yeah excuse me uh uh, uh, ano muna natin? Uh, interrupt muna kita na uh, nandito lang si Dean. No? I-welcome natin si Dean ng graduate school. All right. Okay. Sure. Hi, Dean. Um, um, uh, Dr. Jocelyn Cruz. Uh, si Dean of graduate school. Ma'am? Okay. A little Good message, ma'am. A little message. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, I would like to introduce to you our speaker, JC Padilla. Good afternoon. Hi, hello, Mr. Engineer Carlo Jose Carlo Padilla, for having accepting the challenge of uh, the topic contract administration 101. You know, and uh, I'm happy to see uh, 37, more or less 36 participants who give to this uh, management. We have the Just Corporation, uh, Just Construction Camp, uh, Corporation, and the uh, UBC Graduate School, who collaborated with this uh, activity. And uh, I'm welcoming all the participants, and I'm I'm sure that this will help those who wants to be uh, a contractor someday or to <laughs> to dwell in the construction business to take note of this. Uh, Topic construction contract. Malimit dito mar marami na nagkakaroon ng problema, no? Hablahan and, and uh, so forth. So, uh, thank you, Engineer uh, Jose Carlo Padilla, and welcome to the participants mm -hmm. and also to uh, Dr. Jofiel Hoxon and to our uh, extension coordinator, Dr. Jet Aquino. Welcome and thank you. Good afternoon. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Okay, JC, sorry. All right, so uh, we um, continue with the presentation. All right, so uh, where am I? All right, so as I have said, uh, the Article 1713 of the Civil Code of the Philippines Divine, uh, defines what a construction contract is. So the definition of the uh, construction contract in the Philippines is guarded or um, defined in a legislative instrument such as uh, the civil code. So now we will now be proceeding with the standard forms of contract because if you may not be aware, there are several uh, standard forms of contract because contracts can be difficult to draft and at, at least challenging to draft. So what uh, the industry practitioners or the industry experts did is that they, um, is that they uh, devised standard forms of contract which are widely used 
widely used and very popular in the construction industry. So uh, standard forms of contracts that I have said earlier are templates or standardized agreements, which supplies the legal basis and mechanisms and remedies, which safeguards the contracting parties' rights and obligations concerning the contracted construction works. The standard forms of contracts are, are drafted by institutions with the support of the professionals and industry stakeholders. The standard forms of contract are prescriptive insofar as it provides guidelines on the operation of the contract, which will assist in the contracting parties uh, in the administration of their contract. And finally, the standard forms of contract are published by institutions, which defines the standards in the uh, industry. So in the next slides, we will look at the standard forms of contracts available in the construction mar uh, market and the institutions that publish them. So uh, probably the first, uh, arguably the most famous of the construction contracts, uh, uh, standard forms of contract is the FEDIX suit of contract. So FEDIX stands for Federation Internationale des Ingenieurs Conseil, or the Federation of International Consulting Engineers. FEDIX is an organization of 102 countries. It is known to be a contract written by the engineers for the engineers. FEDIX form of contract is widely used around the world and in numerous jurisdictions, making it or making the interpretation of the clauses supported by a wealth of case laws and jurisprudence. FIDIC contracts has currently five iterations, uh, which suits traditional procurement uh, for the red book, uh, design and build procurement for yellow book, uh, design, build, operate, EPC, or what we call turnkey contracts, and that will be for silver book, and a short form of contract, which is the green book. The second most popular uh, standard form of forms of contract is the JCT or the Joint Contracts Tribunal. So the JCT suit of contract is one, if not most, the, uh, the most popular standard uh, form of contract used in the United Kingdom. In fact, it accounts for 70% of the standard forms used in the UK. So the JCT consists of seven member organizations, which represents the sectors in the industry. Uh, among these uh, member organizations is the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors and the uh, Chartered Institution of Building. The current edition of JCT is 2016, uh, and it has four main variants for contracts procured through traditional procurement, uh, the design and build route, management contracting, and integrated team partnering. And finally, in the Philippines, we have uh, what we call the Uniform General Conditions of Contract for government construction and for private construction, both issued by the CIAP or the Construction Industry Authority of the Philippines. So now having discussed uh, the standard forms of contract, we are now ready to look at the provisions usually contained in the standard forms of contract. So first issue that we will be uh, discussing today is variations. So variations is a common occurrence in construction contracts. Due to the complexity of the construction projects, variations are inevitable. And without an express provision allowing the parties to vary the works, parties do not have the power to do such unless they agree and enter into a new contract. So therefore, absent a clear provision for variations in the construction contract, the contractor cannot compel to comply with instructions to vary the works. And, excuse me. And that's where the standard conditions of contracts prove to be useful. And in cases of bespoke contracts, variation clauses is something to look out for. So a variation mechanism or procedure is important so that disputes could be avoided in the event the contract needs to be varied. All standard forms of contract that I have uh, described earlier includes within them a provision that allows for the works to be varied. So in this section, we will be discussing the nature of the variation, who is uh, the party entitled to, to issue an instruction to vary the contract, and the procedure that is to be employed uh, to accommodate these variations. 
So what is the nature? What is the nature of variation? What is variation? So there are various circumstances that may give rise to uh, instructing a variation, such as inter alia uh, changes to specifications and quantities, discrepancies between the construction drawings and the contract drawings, and so on and so forth. So variation also may arise from conditions which are unforeseeable to both parties when the contract was concluded. It is important to note, however, that the wordings and descriptions, including specifications provided in the contract, are not limits to what a variation is. And then in cases where compliance to the construction, oh, sorry, instruction will lead to the contractor incurring additional costs, the contractor may, according to the provisions of the contract, be compensated in terms of monies, extension of time for completion, or both. While a specific work is not mentioned in the descriptions, it is generally accepted that the contractor has an implied obligation to carry out the works and bring such works to completion. So therefore, all the works which are indispensably necessary are included and does not give rise to a variation. In other words, if a specific work is, that is not included in the description in the bills of quantities or in the specification in the contract documents, uh, but indispensably necessary, meaning the contractor cannot bring that specific work to completion without carrying out that work, then that is not a variation order. So who then has the power to vary the works? So in a standard form of contract, the contract administrator is empowered to vary the works. Absent the express provision in the contract, the contract administrator ha, uh, does not have the power to vary the works. In the standard conditions of contract, the contract administrator acting as the employer's agent has the power to vary the works. In case of FIDIC Red Book 2017, this power is provided in subclause 13.3, which we call variation procedure. The subclause provides that the engineer is empowered to issue an instruction to vary by way of a notice uh, describing the required change and should state any implications on costs. The engineer, who is the contract administrator under the FIDIC uh, Red Book, at any time prior to the issuance or take, uh, issuance of taking over certificate may initiate a variation orders by issuing an instruction or by requesting from the contractor a proposal prior to the issuance of the instruction. If your contract is bespoke, meaning it is not in a standard form, you must check your contract on who is the person empowered to issue the variation instruction and make sure that uh, any, any instruction to vary the works is in line or is compliant with what is provided in the contract. So there are various circumstances that may give rise for instructing a variation uh, order. And when those circumstances arise, what form does an instruction uh, take? So first, the instructions should be in writing. So any instruction to vary must be in writing. Uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily in a letter, but it should contain express instructions to specify the change uh, to, to specify the change that must be made. If the, uh, if the instruction is issued orally, then uh, the construct, uh, the instruction must be made uh, or must be confirmed in writing so that it will comply with the uh, in writing uh, requirement. So finally, uh, as a summary to this uh, section, Variation clauses, when incorporated in the contract, ultimately will afford the contracting parties a certain degree of flexibility insofar as the scope of the contract is concerned. However, once an instruction to vary is issued and absent any valid reason to resist compliance, the legal implication of an instruction to vary is that the contractor uh, is the contractor's uh, necessary compliance. Since the effects of the variation can either increase or decrease the contract sum, these clauses also inevitably cause uncertainty to the budget of the whole of the project. Therefore, management of the variation, uh, variations 
is necessary to keep the project within the limits uh, in terms of costs. So after discussing or having discussed variations, we will now proceed with the next subtopic, which is uh, the extension of time. So most, if not all construction contracts are time barred in a sense as a, the contractor shall deliver the contracted works or services within the agreed date. If the contractor fails to do so, the contractor is in breach of contract and therefore the employer may be entitled to recover liquidated damages or, in, or any remedy expressly provided in the contract. However, if the contractor at any point in the performance of the contract was disrupted or prevented by the employer or by events which are beyond its control, the contractor may be entitled uh, to extension of time. This section will explore and discuss the legal basis for the extension of time and its legal underpinnings under the issues uh, and other issues surrounding uh, time for extension. So extension of time clauses are indeed important as they preserve the rights of the employer to recover liquidated damages and enable the contractor to be informed of their financial exposure when uh, delays occur. First, you have to stop establish when claiming for extension of time is the factual basis. The contractor has an implied obligation to bring the contracted works to completion without delay, meaning within the contract period. Therefore, if the contractor is interrupted or the contractor, the contractor must be compensated with time or money or both, provided that the delay was not caused by them. This is the first burden that the contractor must overcome for them to be entitled to extension of time. The delaying event is not attributable to them. Proof of the delay or proof of the event occurring must be documented and shall be included in the submission of notice or claim. The second, uh, the second burden that the contractor must overcome is the establishment of the legal basis. So while the right to extension of time is in the contract, it is not automatically given. Therefore, if the contractor deems the delay incurred are excusable, meaning not caused by them, the contractor must reserve its right to extension of time by following the procedures set forth in the contract, such as submission of notices in the prescribed form, clearly identifying the entitlement and including all information and substantiation within the time bar. Most contracts provide a duty to mitigate as a condition precedent to the entitlement for extension of time. So you have to also prove that you have mitigated and have no choice after doing mitigation, uh, mitigation uh, measures that you still will be delayed. And then finally, the third uh, burden and the probably the most difficult burden to overcome is proving that you have, you have been delayed. So this is what we call the delay analysis. For the contractor to be entitled to an extension of time, the contractor must prove that the event which has occurred has caused them delay. There are several delays, uh, delay analysis procedures to determine the effect or the lack thereof of an event. Delay analysis will also lead the determination, uh, sorry, the delay analysis will also lead to the de determination of the quantum of the delay in terms of days, months, etc., and the cost that comes along with it, such as loss and expense and other damages that are due under the contract and under the law. So what if the contract does not have an extension of time procedure or does not have an extension of time mechanism? Then we consider that the contract is at large. So as mentioned earlier in the slides, construction contracts are time barred in the sense that they must be performed and completed within the agreed period. But what if the contract this does not contain such mechanism. So the, uh, the contract enters a state that we call time at large. So when the contract is set at large, the time is uh, no longer uh, binding on the, con uh, on the contractor. 
So time is deemed to have been at large when the agreed completion date expires and that there is no mechanism in the contract that allows for extension or when the mechanism in the contract has broken down and becomes unenforceable. So what is the effect? So the effect of the time being set at large is that the contractor is released from its obligation to complete the project within the agreed period and the contractor is instead allowed to complete the project within a reasonable time. Furthermore, when the time is at large, the employer can no longer recover liquidated damages from the contractor arising from its failure to complete the project within the agreed time. So we've been discussing uh, extension of time uh, in the previous slides, but who has the power to, who is entitled, or who is empowered to extend the time? So in standard forms of contract, it is the contract administrator who is empowered to extend the time for completion. The standard building contract gives the contract administrator the power to adjust the completion date of the contract in cases where relevant events occur, which delay the contractor from performing his uh, obligations, such as natural causes and acts of men. The contract administrator, upon receipt of notice from the contractor of the delay or occurrence of a real relevant event, the contractor shall notify the contract administrator of such, uh, of such event, and the contract administrator will then reply within reasonable time before the expiry of the time bar. So while the contract administrator has the discretion in granting the extension, the arbitrator or the court may intervene in circumstances where an allegation of bias or inequity in the decision is present. This was the position of the court in the case of John Barker versus London Portman, where the court held in that case that, uh, the, unbe that the court or an arbitral tribunal may open and review the decisions of the contract administrator when the mechanism provided for in the contract has broken down or when the application of the provisions of the contract are incorrectly applied or interpreted in a man uh, which resulted in a manner uh, that is biased to one party and therefore not fair. So what are the delaying events? So I have classified the delaying events into three categories. So delaying events or events which were caused by the employer, which uh, delaying events which were caused by nature and other events which cannot be classified under employer and nature. So among the risks or among the um, Delaying events caused by the employer is failure to give possession uh, to the site to the contractor, failure to issue information in a timely manner, defaults on payment, suspension of the works, instructions relating to variations and provisional sum. Uh, uh, delaying events which were which are of natural causes are exceptionally adverse weather conditions, natural catastrophes, force majeure and epidemics which uh, may result in movement control or restrictions. Other uh, events are changes in legislation, civil commotion such as wars, terrorism, and strikes, and uh, shortage in manpower or labor, and changes in statutory requirements. So uh, as you can see, the current pandemic there, the delaying event of the caused by or the pandemic being a delaying event is not necessarily under the contract. However, the, the circumstances or the events resulting out of the pandemic may qualify the contractor to extension of time. So I'm expecting questions about this later uh, in the question and answer. So having discussed uh, the extension of time, we will now be proceeding with the discussion on liquidated damages. What is liquidated damages? So it is important to distinguish uh, damages arising out of a breach of contract and claims which arise out of the term, uh, out of the terms in the contract. So th therefore this section will explore and discuss remedies for breach of contract, such as 
liquidated damages and contractual claims such as claims for direct loss and expense, global claims, etc., which are rooted in the mutual liability, which mutual liability claims for the compensation of both the employer and the contractor. But before proceeding uh, with the discussion, it is important to distinguish damage and damages. So damages are compensatory, compensatory in nature. In other words, damages are a sum of money awarded to the party who suffered loss or injury due to a breach of contract. The objective of damages is to restore the status of the injured party to a state that is as if the injury or loss did not occur. Damage, on the other hand, is the loss or the injury suffered by one party due to the negligent act or breach of contract by the other party. So what is liquidated damages then? So where a contract exists, the terms of contract will generally provide a mechanism to remedy the party's breaches. When the employer defaults, or fails to perform its obligation, the contractor is entitled to extension of time. However, if the contractor defaults on its obligation to complete the project within the contract period, the employer is entitled to recover what we call liquidated damages. So hen hence the question, what is liquidated damages? So liquidated damages are an agreed sum of money that becomes payable by the contractor to the employer in the event of the contractor's breach, say for example, delay in performance or what we call culpable delay. Liquidated damages or liquidated a certain damages in some jurisdictions is a genuine pre-estimate of the employer's potential losses, which may include loss of profit or income, cost of financing, alternative accommodations, and so on and so forth. In determining the exact or precise number of damages that is brought about by a delay in performance can be expensive, challenging, and time-consuming. So therefore, the parties agree in the outset a figure that is uh, likely to be the sum of money that will be come, or that will be the loss of the employer, and then it will be recovered by the employer from the contractor when a culpable delay occurs. So that's, uh, that's the nature of liquidated damages. And I would also like to highlight the difference between a common, uh, the liquidated damages in common law jurisdiction and in civil law jurisdiction. So common law countries or common law jurisdictions are, uh, are countries such as Australia, United Kingdom, Singapore, uh, Canada, and so on and so forth. So in these jurisdictions, uh, the liquidated damages are in, unenforceable if the delay, or sorry, if the sum is punitive. So liquidated damages in a construction, uh, sorry, in a common law jurisdiction is not a penalty. This concept was established in the case of Dunlop Pneumatic Pair Company versus uh, Selfridge and Company. So in that case, the court held that while the liquidated damages is a genuine pre-estimate of losses, it may be deemed as a penalty when uh, first the sum is extravagant and unfair when compared with the greatest loss that can be proved to have arisen out of the breach, or it is considered a penalty when the sum is greater than the sum which ought to be, or which ought to have been paid. And finally, it is a penalty when the sum is made payable as a weight of compensation on the occurrence of one or more events, which are serious and uh, uh, which are not serious and others, but trivial in uh, or trivial in nature. This was the ruling as well in the case of Phillips versus Attorney General of Hong Kong. So, in a nutshell, in a common law jurisdiction, if you are practicing in a common law jurisdiction, a liquidated damages clause is unenforceable if it is punitive, meaning it acts as a penalty. When contrasted in the Philippines. In a, such, uh, or in a civil law jurisdiction such as the Philippines and other uh, Eastern European nations, a liquidated damages clause, which may be seen as a penalty, is enforceable provided it is not unfair. This is the view taken as an, uh, this view is taken as an encouragement 
for performance of contractual obligations. While traditionally civil law countries do not distinguish between penalties and liquidated damages, the courts now narrows the scope of the penalties clause and liquidated damages. So in recent cases, uh, the liquidated damages clause when found to be extravagant is reduced to reflect a more realistic amount of the harm done to the claimant. This was the position of the Supreme Court of the Philippines when it ruled in the case of R.S. Tomas versus uh, Rizal Cement Company, where the court held that the decision of the lower court in reducing the amount of the liquidated damages because it is unfair, is justified and correct. So there's the conundrum between a civil law jurisdiction and a common law jurisdiction. So in the Philippines, as I have said earlier, uh, the courts consider liquidated damages as penalties to be enforceable. So what are the legal basis found in the legislation that we have? So in the Civil Code of the Philippines provides uh, the legal basis uh, for the nature and the entitlement of liquidated damages. Article 2226 uh, of the Civil Code provides that liquidated damages are those agreed upon by the parties to a contract, and these are to be paid in breach uh, when a breach of the contract occurs. In 2227, liquidated damages is defined or liquidated damages, whether intended as an indemnity or a penalty, shall be equitably reduced if they are inequitous or unconscionable meaning unfair. And finally, in Article 2228 of the Civil Code of the Philippines provides uh, that the legal basis, I'm oh, sorry, that uh, the contract committed by the defendant is not the one contemplated by the parties in agreeing upon the liquidated damages, the law shall determine the measure of the damages and not the stipulation. So what 2228 means is that the court has when the sum or when the liquidated damages uh, validity is put into question, the court has the power to determine the actual measures of the liquidated damages clause rather than what has been agreed. So the court can step in and revise the amount. So I have, I have mentioned earlier the case of our, uh, uh, R.S. Tomas. So just to give you a brief uh, case study or the background of this case. So R.S. Tomas and Rizal Cement Company entered into a contract which concerns the supply of labor, materials, and technical supervision for a series of job orders, which among others is the installation of line system, primary protection switch, and conversion of transformers. So the sum for the contracted works to which Rizal Cement agreed to pay in exchange change of R.S. Tomas' performance is 2,944,000, uh, which is due to complete after 120 days of the contract taking effect. So their contract provides for 29,440 per day of delay, which is uh, the representation of the 10% of the contract sum. R.S. Tomas acquired a performance. Sorry, uh, the uh, the liquidated damages clause is capped at 10% of the contract sum. So R.S. Tomas acquired a performance bond amounting to 50% of the total contract sum, which is 1,458,618 for the full and faithful completion of the project. So during the course of uh, the construction, there were delays which were uh, attributable to uh, result cement, and this went to an arbitration, and then the arbitration was appealed in court, and the court, the Supreme Court, intervened in 2012. So the legal question, uh, which were put uh, among the other questions that were put uh, before the court, is: Is R.S. Tomas liable to recover liquidated damages? The court says yes. Uh, it had. Its liability arises out of uh, the liquidity damages. So the, the Supreme Court sustained the uh, decision of the arbitrator. The court explained the legal principle of party autonomy, where the parties are free 
to enter into a contract. And if the contract is concluded, uh, they are bound uh, to its terms, including liquidated damages. And by applying the same, the court ruled that Rizal Cement Company is entitled to recover liquidated damages from Tomas, uh, RS Tomas defaults. The court awarded the full sum amounting to 10% of the contract sum, ruling that, the, ruling that while the court can reduce the amount of the liquidated damages in cases where it is unfair or unconscionable, it is not in this case. So uh, if we can, uh, analyzing the case or the decision of the Supreme Court, if your current contract has a limit of 10% of the total contract sum, that is deemed to be uh, fair and reasonable by the court. So there are other uh, similar cases uh, to this uh, RS Tomas, which were decided earlier, such as the Phil Invest Land versus Pacific Equipment uh, et al. and the Urban Consolidated Contractors of the Philippines versus Insular Life Assurance uh, Corporation. So in conclusion, liquidated damages are genuine pre-estimate of the likely losses of the employer in the event the contractor defaults on his obligations to perform the contract within the agreed uh, construction or within the agreed contract period. Liquidated damages are agreed upon by the parties on the onset or on the conclusion of the contract. If question in so far as its intentions is raised to a court, it will be reduced by the court if it is found to be iniquitous meaning immoral or unconcernable, meaning unfair. While common law jurisdictions where the court will refuse enforcement if the sum is penal or trivial in a civil law jurisdiction such as the Philippines, the civil code does not make a distinction between a penalty and the liquidated damages and therefore will enforce the agreed sum except when it is again, as mentioned above, immoral or unfair. And uh, with that, the presentation ends and thank you for your attention. And we may now start the question and answer part of the lecture. Okay, thank you. Thank you, JC. Now, merong tanong dito eh. Uh, wait, uh, saan ba yun? Chat. So, yung nature ng contract administration is very legalistic uh, because we are looking at the specifications and the, the specific terms in the contract. So uh, it's important to have a very good legal basis. Okay, first question. Uh, sir, hi sir. What is your insight regarding claims for extension of time and additional cost and expense due to the pandemic? Now he is referring to the COVID-19 pandemic. We have you have to, as I have said earlier, no, you have to determine whether you are claiming uh, for costs incurred because of the pandemic or these costs are arising out of uh, regulations out of the pandemic. Say, for example, movement controls, uh, extra safety uh, preconditions on site. Uh, reduced labor because we are reducing manpower on site to uh, minimize tra uh, transmission. So are these really arising out of the pandemic or are these arising out of regulations or limitations brought about by the pandemic? So you have to differentiate that. And in cases or in contracts where they enumerate the list of the delays and pandemic is not there, you cannot claim uh, directly uh, for the costs arising out of the pandemic. So you have to, uh, in establishing your legal basis, you have to uh, be sure on your uh, grounds insofar as your uh, contract provisions is concerned. Okay. And, uh, any other questions? And here's the, uh, some comment. Uh, it says here that depending on the contract provisions, cost entitlement is valid due to the changes in legislations, which covers government directives or change in law. Yes, uh, that view is uh, correct. Okay. Any other questions? 
Do you have any other questions? Any I other actually questions? made my presentation quite short. Uh, it's less than an hour so that at least we can have ample time oh, yeah. for discussion for questions. Any questions uh, from the contractors? No? Right, three questions. Uh, those who raise uh, their hands or you can unmute and ask questions if you can. Any questions, clarifications, comments, suggestions? Hello? Okay, okay. Mukhang naiintindihan ah. Ang follow-up question, si Ma'am Marites dito. Yeah, sige basahin natin. Hi sir, is the extension of bans and insurances claimable as a result of the time extension approval? Yes. Uh, you can, uh, that will be under uh, loss and expense claims or what we call prolongation claims. Yes, it is claimable. Okay. Yes, it is claimable. But you have to take note that the actual cost of uh, the extension, it is not based on the uh, amount in the contract and then just, div uh, just divide it, you know, just prorate it. Usually, that's what we do. Say, for example, the cost of the bond that is in the uh, stated in the POQ bills of quantity, say, for example, 100,000. And then um, the contract period is uh, 10 months. So there will be 10,000 per month. And say, for example, you extend, you were, your contract was extended for a further three months. So the claim is not 30,000 uh, as uh, prorated, but the actual amount which has been paid uh, by the contractor to the insurance company or to the uh, broker or the guarantor. Okay. Questions? More? Uh, sir, uh, my text message uh, uh, this is for the benefit of the contractors listening here. No? Uh, the text says uh, could you please, uh, please clarify on the on the request for time extensions, no? the reasons for the request for time extension. Uh, could you please clarify what are those? Sorry, again, sir, sir, I did not get For that. the request of time extension of okay. the, let's say for example, of the contractor. Mm -hmm. What are the reasons or the valid reasons for the request of uh, time extensions of the contractor? Well, uh, uh, yeah, as, as, so long as the delay is not caused by the contractor, uh, then you you may be entitled for extension of time. Yes, but, uh, for the extension of time. Of, yes, uh, of uh, so, but not all extensions of time are, uh, the, the contractor is compensated on both uh, money and time. There are events, say for example, the neutral events, where the contractor is only entitled for extension of time. But the delays caused by the employer, then the contractor will be compensated both on money and extension of time. So you have to be uh, very careful in distinguishing those two. And make sure that uh, if you are applying for extension of time, your claim must be within the time bar or within the um, time limit stipulated in the contract. Say, for example, in FIDIC, you are required, the contractor is required to submit the claim within 14 days of uh, the delaying event of, uh, occurs. Other than that, uh, say, for example, you submit it on the 15th day, that claim, regardless of its merits, uh, will not be considered. Okay. Uh, um, pahabol daw. Uh, for example, uh, for uh, pandemic, no, uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic is one reason for the extension of time, right? Now, mm -hmm. uh, ang sabi is that uh, what will be the basis, no? Uh, for the extension of time due to COVID pandemic, what will uh, be so, this? Yeah, yeah. So I, uh, you have to make sure uh, you know, when establishing your legal basis. You have to make sure what are the reasons. Uh, what is your legal basis? Are you clearly claiming because of the pandemic only, or are you claiming because of the events occurring? Uh, as a result of the pandemic. Say, for example, yung movement controls, uh, na, delay, uh, um, na delay yung mga shipments abroad or disruption, loss of productivity because 
before the pandemic, it's 10. Now it's only five because of your compliance to the government uh, instructions, which we consider legislations okay. or government actions. So you have to be very clear on that. Yes, sir. Okay. There is a question from the chat box. Uh, sir, COVID-19 pandemic is considered as a first major. If yes, since usually first major is part of the contract provisions, therefore, the costs incurred due to the government due to government regulations are valid to claims. Uh, medyo uh, convoluted yung, ano, yung question. So first, I, so it's I asking for the, yeah, asking first for the COVID pandemic. Yes, uh, if as, pandemic is con yeah. is the pandemic considered a force major uh, event, uh, I have advised many clients about this, uh, and my decision will always or uh, my 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 answer to them is always what is in your contract. So okay. there are certain contracts where a pandemic is uh, actually uh, provided in the uh, in the delaying events. There are certain contracts na nakasulat lang is force majeure. So how will you, uh, and the, the thing is that when you, when your contract only specifies force majeure, what is force majeure? Then the question will be, what is force majeure? Is pandemic a force majeure? So it will depend. And then your question will evolve or will move on to what is force majeure? In China, which is a civil law jurisdiction, they, the, the government issued a certificate actually saying that uh, the pandemic is force majeure. However, the validity of the certificate na yon is still uh, untested in courts, but luckily, most uh, Chinese companies accepted that, that a certificate. However, outside China, that will be very difficult um, in the... Um, uh, in justifying that the pandemic is force majeure. However, my suggestion is that look at your contract. Meron ba nakasulat dyan na legislation? Meron bang nakasulat dyan na shortage of manpower? Meron ba dyan nakasulat na shortage of materials? Then if, the, if that's the case, then you can claim for uh, extension of time using those uh, events and not, not the pandemic. But if your contract's expressly provides that a delaying event, uh, a pandemic is a delaying event, then that's fine. You can claim for that. Okay, next question. It is valid to have a contract that doesn't allow variation order? Uh, okay, uh, as I have said, I have said earlier, now the parties are free to agree on the uh, terms and conditions of the contract. So if you, are go if you are entering into a contract which does not have a variation order, then that's the risk of the contractor. So if the contract does not provide or does not include a variation order clause, then kapag when you need to, to uh, vary the work, say for example, uh, changes in materials or just even changes in quantities, you have to enter into another contract, which it will be time consuming because there will be negotiations and then there will be disputes like Mashadu Mahal or what will be the basis of the rates and so on and so forth. So uh, it is enforceable, but it, it will be very risky uh, for the contractor to undertake such contract. Okay. Another question Is the contractor entitled for profits? On expenses related to COVID pandemic? Mm. Uh, for loss of profit, no, because we are only considering uh, direct losses and loss of profit is not a direct, uh, direct loss or direct costs. So usually we just like overheads. Um, these are uh, not, uh, how do I say it, non direct costs. So the direct costs are just, say, for example, uh, yun nga, yung extension of uh, costs for extensions of insurance and bonds, uh, office rentals, st site staff, uh, machineries, uh, which were idle or stuff like that. But profit, no. The profits, uh, profit is uh, considered not a direct loss. Okay, some more questions? 
Oh, here is a clarification. Uh, ano, a question, brother. Follow up, sir. To Ms. Cruz, it is claimable if suspension is contractor initiated for the bonds and in insurances. What is the reason for the suspension? Yun yung unang tanong. Is it is the suspension because COVID COVID, COVID nineteen pandemic? And then, uh, what is what is the leak? And then, we just pupunta na tayo do sa do sa again do sa root cause. So, ano yung legal basis ng suspension? Is it because they received an order from the government that uh, yeah, I guess. that they have to suspend the works, or did they uh, did they out of their own volition? No, uh, yes, it is. It says here it, it is contractor initiated. So if it's contractor initiated, what is the motivation? Is it important? I mean, motivation. Sir, uh, hello. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, please. Um, Miss Macy, po. Okay, go ahead. So, um, sir, the uh, what I'm asking is, the suspension is, dahil uh, sa permit acquisition. So, si suspend yung project. Then, upon lifting, nag uh, claim si contractor ng uh, claim for uh surety. Carry and performance fund. Okay. So it because is claimable of the, because of the suspension. Suspension and uh, the risk of the. Because uh, you because of the application of the permit, correct? Yes, sir. So. Kanino risk? Sila, sila yung nag-initiate mag uh, mag-request na suspension dahil na hindi sila magkuha ng permit sa government. Then ayun po uh, nagbigay si employer ng suspension. Due to the request of the contractor. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh. What if okay. sila? Kasi po sa FIDIC, if I may not, if I may not mistaken, mer pwedeng uh, i-notify ni contractor si uh, mm -hmm. insurer or si bonding company if such events will happen or happen. I'm not sure on that specific provision, pero I know a provision that... Uh, Give the right, uh, that, that gives the right to the contractor to suspend the works. But the reasons are also there and they're very limited. So anyway, I, I think, I, so is that a question or parang na-encounter mo lang siya on your side? Na so, uh, settled na yung, ano, settled na yung, uh, yung issue? So uh, insight lang, sir, if... Uh... Pwede bang maklaim yun ni contractor if initiated niya ang uh, request? Kasi um, yung, yung, yung main reason or yung root cause ng suspension is because of the contractor's failure to get permits, correct? Actually, hindi niya failure ba yun, sir? Kasi kumuha naman siya, hindi lang talaga siya mapagbigyan ng concerned uh, agency. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So now we're very, medyo yung, 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 yung lawyer hat ko medyo nas, nasuot ko. So kung tatanungin kita ngayon, uh, merong permit o wala? Walang permit. Then the contractor failed, correct? Yeah, ah, yeah. Uh, so if that's the case, if that's the case, then the contractor is not entitled. Kasi nasa mm. risk ni contractor, nasa okay, risk sir. ni contractor yung, yung permit. Uh, hmm. acquisition. Okay, sir. But, but regardless, kung sinabi mo na because of that, nag-issue ng instruction si employer to suspend the works, then you have an argument. Kasi sasabihin mo, oh, ikaw yung nag-order ng suspension. So, regardless kung kami yung nag-initiate hmm. or hindi, you still issue the suspension. And suspension under the contract by the employer entitles the contractor for the uh, additional costs. Incurred. So it, it's very uh kung titignan mo very complicated yung scenario mo, but yes, you deduce it, you deduce it into what is provided in the contract. And kung sino talaga yung may risk. So you can argue on that uh on that uh on that point. But it, but then that's not an advice, ha opinion lang. So pag ginawa no, okay, mo yun, and then baka, baka you sue me for 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 your losses kasi nag-comply or sinunod mo yung advice because that's just an opinion okay okay so thank <laughs> you so much don't quote me on that all right don't quote me on that
Uh, what, uh, here's another text, uh, uh, JC. Um, it says that the contractor, for example, he, he likes to claim uh, for, for an extension of time, but the reason is uh, due to suppliers' delay, third party suppliers' delay you know, of the mm -hmm. materials. Uh, can the contractor claim it as to the proponent as, an ex as a reason for extension of time? So, si contractor meron siyang contract with the employer, correct? Yes, and then si yes. contractor employed another subcontractor for the supplier of the materials. Actually, the, the supplier of materials would be by the contractor, but he has the supplier to supply to him. Yes. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. again, uh, we will be employing the privity of uh, the privity of contracts. Walang kinalaman si employer dun sa mga subcontracts mo. So once ang, ang liability mo, ang liability mo kasi kay employer is to deliver the materials and to complete the works. Ngayon, when you employ a subcontractor who will su supply your materials or your goods, that becomes your risk. So yeah. if na-delay ka, if na-delay ka because of that subcontractor, wala nang... Uh, sorry for the lack of a better term, pero wala na pakialam doon yung, yeah, yung uh, employer. Uh, yeah, correct. Yung employer. Kasi it, it's between you and your subcontractor. So yeah. for, for the employer, titignan lang niya ano ba yung liability mo sa akin. So, ang isang way na pwedeng i-resolve those kind of issues is to pass the risk ni main contractor to subcontractor niya. Kailangan meron ka ding liquidated damages clause. Yeah. Okay. Para oh, just okay. in case ma-recover ma -recover yung liquidity damages sa'yo, i-recover mo lang din yung kay client. So wala kang loss. Yeah. He further mentioned that the reason of the supplier's delay is due to COVID-19 pandemic. That would be a reason for the extension? Regardless. Again, yeah. regardless. <laughs> so the contractor, the contractor's agreement at saka yung subcontractor's agreement niya, it's a separate agreement from okay. the main agreement itself. So... Ang, ang, ang solution that, to that is tingnan niya yung uh, tingnan mo yung ano yung yung terms and conditions mo with your subcontractor and mm. from there titingnan mo ngayon yung uh, titingnan mo ngayon yung terms and conditions mo with uh, the main contract and the employer kung paano mo ma mitigate or ma maayos yung para ma minimize yung loss mo so yeah Agree. Uh, any questions? Any questions? Unmute your speaker and uh, speak for some clarifications. I guess may mga contractor tayo dyan. No? Pwede di ano ah. Pwede tayo mag Tagalog. Ta Anintindihan naman ni JC yan. Oh, yes, Tess. Hi. Hi, sir. Uh magtatanong lang po ako regarding dun sa ano what if uh, yung contractor failed to give a uh, notice of claim uh, uh, say about time or, or variation within the specified time ng contract okay lang ba na i mean outright denial na ba ng claim yun ng ano niya ng entitlement niya okay uh yun na yung question apa all right so um in a common law jurisdiction, say for example, in as I have said, begin look at perspective on the difference of the two ano, jurisdictions. No? In a common law jurisdiction, say for example, in Singapore, UK, Australia, Canada, it is an outright uh, uh, decline, meaning uh, regardless of the merits, uh, regardless of the merits of the case, kapag hindi mo na comply yung time bar, say for example, you have to submit it in 14 days. Sinabit mo siya on the 15th day, Hindi na pwede yun. Uh, you, your, cl your claim has been forfeited. Okay? However, in a civil law jurisdiction such as the Philippines, actually, may, gina may sinusulat ako regarding this uh, issue. Uh, in the Philippines, ang argument kasi dyan is it is unfair. Diba? The same principle applies sa liquidated damages. Kapag ang clause, ang contractual clause is unfair, uh, is unfair, pwede pumastok si court or si arbitral tribunal to decide whether uh, whether to allow or not to allow the claim. So in a civil law jurisdiction, pwede mong i-argue on that point na it's unfair kasi we're working from home, 
wala kaming staff and stuff like that. So pwede mo i-argue yun sa court. In a in a civil law jurisdiction pwede mo, it's still arguable. Uh meron ka pang med, meron ka pang so-called ray of light uh na chance for that claim to to be uh considered. Pero in a common law jurisdiction that is an outright no kasi very strict sila sa, sa ano. Very strict sila sa uh, performance or sa time bars. Uh, uh, sir, follow-up question lang ulit. Uh, okay. May same case kasi ko, kaya ako siya natanong. Uh, hindi ba parang nagko-conflict yung mga technical requirements as to the contract versus dun sa legal requirement? Kasi we had the same case na ano po, uh, <clears throat> nag-fail ng notification si contractor sa amin. So, outright din inay namin dahil nga doon sa technicalities. Parang say about a year bago siya nagsabi na magkiklaim siya. But then again, nung nakarating kami sa legal point of view, uh, uh, lumalabas dahil nga meron kami inspector on site. Noon sa inspector yung nangyari on site. So parang doon tinignan ni legal na, na kung may notice o wala, the fact na aware yung, yung representative ni employer doon sa nangyaring variations on site, Ibig sabihin, parang tinatanggap mo siya na claimable dahil wala kang binigay na notice na kinokontest mo yung ginagawa on-site. Parang ganun po yung nangyari. Silence is not consent. So, regardless, regardless kung sabihan, sabihan kita na gawin mo to or regardless kung alam kong na-delay ka, kung wala kang notice, kung wala kang, kung wala, kung ang provision sa contract is kailangan mo akong i-notify. Tapos wala kang binigay na notification sa akin. Then what sense is the contract you get what i mean kung, yeah. kung if you take it as a common knowledge so i think uh the, the the gist or what i'm just trying to say here is that you have to comply with the terms of your contract hindi mo hindi porke alam ni contractor or hindi porke alam ni employer na yung delaying event uh is aware siya do sa delaying event and that might cause you uh uh, that might cause you delay. You still have to send a notification. Kasi paano niya malalaman na makiklaim ka pala? Paano niya ma-allocate yung funds niya? Paano niya ma-allocate yung risks niya? So, k- kaya if a notice is very, very important. And as much as possible, you have to follow what is your contract terms. But again, if if nag-succeed naman yung claim niyo for that, then that's good. Uh, I'm always for... Uh, amicable settlement and the resolution of dispute. So if if at the end of the day it, it was allowed, then that's better. Okay, sir. Actually, yeah. uh, nag-end na yung issue. Ang nangyari nga is ano, amicable settlement siya. Mm-hmm. Ang nangyari. Pero ang nangyari nga, nakapag-claim siya. Although yes. walang notice. Yes, that's sir. good Sige po. Thank you po. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mamarites. Sir JC, another question here from Sir Raimundo. So, if the contractor suffers delay due to the restrictions set by authorities like limited working time for public convenience, is the contractor entitled to cost claim? In, th- in terms of costs, uh, I would have to look at the contract first. But uh, uh, as a rule of thumb, kapag hindi si employer yung naging cost ng delay then walang claim for a uh, cost or walang entitlement to cost si contractor time lang pag neutral yung event pag i think it, it this is a good uh, guidance no kapag neutral yung event meaning hindi kasalanan ng either ng contractor or ng client ang entitlement mo will be just time Pero ang pero say for example ang delay mo is caused by the employer, then you will be uh, compensated or uh, they will give you time plus cost. Yun yung, yun yung I think uh, magandang guidance don. Okay, thank you, Sir So another question from Ma'am Christine and Abarca. So, our government issued an order on what are the things the employer should shoulder as a result of the pandemic. What if the government does not explicitly mention that the employer 
should pay for the extension of bonds and insurances as a result of the pandemic. Then is it uh, really claimable under prolongation when it is the contractor's responsibility to provide bonds and insurances under the contract? However, the government issued lockdowns which affected the work, hence the extension. So our consultant used that argument. That is why I want to clarify. So again, from Ma'am Christine and Abarca, Sir JC. Uh, okay, uh, medyo mahaba yung tanong. So, yes, sabi niya, our government issued an order on what are the things that the employer should shoulder as a result of the pandemic, correct? So, that is very clear. Kapag uh, nag-issue ng order yung government, you have to comply regardless of what is the stipulation in your contract. Because, again, the governing law always supersedes the contract. And then the, the second part is, what if the government does not explicitly mention that the employer should pay for the extension of bonds and insurances as a result of the pandemic? So if the government did not issue an order, then you look at your contract. Ano ba yung entitlement mo for sa contract? So that's where you will uh, go back to your terms and conditions. And then... The question is, uh, the, another question is, is it really claimable under prolongation when it is the contractor's responsibility to provide bonds and insurances under the contract? Ito yung, ito yung, uh, ito yung sinasabi ko kanina na sino ba yung nag ng delay? So say for example, if the contractor causes the delay, then of course, uh, logically, the contractor should bear the costs for the extensions of such insurances. But if the employer is the cause of the delay, then the employer should bear the costs of the uh, should bear the costs arising out of that delay. But what if neutral yung events? Say for example, this government issue. So that is the risk of the contractor. So unfortunately, unfortunately, hindi siya entitled si contractor hindi siya entitled for that because again, sabi mo nga, it is the contractor's responsibility uh, under the contract. For, to procure such uh, uh, such insurances and bonds, and then, uh, yeah, I think. However, the government issued lockdowns which affected the work. Yeah, I think that's uh, that answers the bulk of the question. Okay, sir. Another clarification: How many times can a contractor be given a time extension for their single or ongoing contract? Ah, so long as so long as there is an event that occurs, the contract uh, that entitles the contractor uh, to extension of time, then they can claim as many as they can. So long as uh, ay ayoko sabihin as many as they can, but so long as an event occurs uh, okay. that entitles them for extension of time. All right, and of course within the time bars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, correct. Okay, uh, any questions? Oh, clarifications. Uh, uh, hi, Sir JC. Uh, may question pa ako. Yes. Uh, sir, may naging senaryo kasi kami sa isang project ko na hawak. Uh, nagkaroon ng delay si project mm -hmm. sa early stage. So, mayroon na siyang delay. Then, after... Uh, a uh, few months, sir. Nagkaroon ka naman kami ng claim na nagkaroon kami ng extension of time due to revision. So ngayon, sir, ang yung unang justification kaya yung sa delay na sinasabi namin is kaya pa namin siyang i-catch I think na cut off si. Ah, Marnie. wala si Manny. Manny. Manny, Manny, chat. Hello Manny. Wala siya. Wala. Very interesting yung point. I would just like to to uh, say no. Very interesting yung point niya kasi I as uh, kasi kanina sinabi sa slides no. Ang isang entitled ang uh, uh, isang condition precedent for entitlement for extension of time ng contractor is mitigation. So, yung sinasabi niya kanina kasi sabi niya, siguro uh, sabihin niya sana, 
sinabi namin na we can still mitigate. Kaya pa naming habulin. But after that, we realized namin ay hindi pala. That is where the uh, that is where the notices come in. Pwede mo sabihin doon na okay, uh merong delaying event ha, pero we will try to we will try to uh mitigate. However, we will reserve our right in the event na sa totoong buhay eh madelay kami. Then uh we will reserve our right to claim for extension of time. That me uh that will uh, not only say preserve your right for extension of time. Mahihit mo pa yung target mo with the time bar na na-notify mo siya. So I hope na nakapag-submit sila ng notice for that. Sure. Okay, so uh, Sir Diofil, nabasa na po ba itong kay follow-up question niya? Yes, sir. Follow-up mo, sir. Ah, okay na, sir. Okay, sir. Tanong, tanong natin. Ah, okay, so uh, Sir JC, another question. So what if there is a clause that says the consultant cannot claim for additional fees due to the time extensions? However, Due to the unforeseen effects of COVID-19 pandemic, they are now claiming prolongation costs. Considering that the pandemic is considered an abnormal condition, is their claim valid? What is... Ano yung nakasulat sa contract? Sorry, medyo. Kasi ganun pa natin sagot ko. What is, what is, is, what is uh, provided for in the contract? Uh, sabi so, is, can a claim for the additional fees due to time extension? Yung sabi ng clause. Usually, because consultancy fees are lump sum fees, eh. so uh, and if they have if they have a clause, say for example, na cannot claim. Yeah, like say for example, lump sum pero may contract period. This is for example, twelve months. So then, uh, if it exceeds twelve months, and then the the contract says no, parang meron din meron din silang thing for extension of time, just in case, uh, just in case. Uh, extend yung contract, then they can claim. Otherwise, they have to establish first yung legal basis. Uh, sir, parang merong pasunod dito. So their contract is coterminous with the BNB contract po. Uh, Christine, Christine, Christine. Hello, Christine. Hello, sir. Oh, uh, yeah. Eh, tanong, ikaw na magtanong. Opo. Yung contract nila is coterminous dun sa contract okay. yung supervise po nila. Ang initial talagang agreement at yung nasa kontrata is hindi sila pwedeng mag-claim uh, in case may time extension. Okay. Pero um, since nagkaroon nga ng pandemic which is out of the argument nung ginagawa pa lang yung contract, sila so yung contract na uh, na conclude or na na finalize yung contract na during the pandemic na um before po before around pandemic. 2017 I think if if you, may provision ka sa contract that says na hindi ka pwedeng mag-claim for extension of time regardless kung ano without any reasons mm-hmm. or well hindi naka enumerate the new reasons then unfortunately you cannot claim for extension of time. Pero maybe you can approach yung client mo and uh, negotiate uh, a settlement siguro na totoo din naman kasi na meron kayong costs na incur. So maybe send feelers uh, to the client na parang you want to claim and you're open for a negotiation of the additional fees. Okay. So um, ina- ang ina ang ina-advise niyo po is for us to settle. Ay, hindi ko ina-advise, ang opinion ko. Okay. <laughs> ang opinion ko is, ang opinion ko is uh, okay. try a try a try a negotiation or hindi ko ina-advise. Okay. <laughs> Kasi may okay. legal connotation yung advice which may expose me to liability na hindi covered ng aking professional oh, oh, oh. indemnity insurance. <laughs> so sa, sa case po kasi namin, kami yung client. Oh. Okay. Oh, so are you client? So oh, are you open for client. that? So th- then the next question, are you open for that? Uh, I mean, 
the are you willing to help <laughs> the, uh, the your your consultant? <laughs> You I, work for, <laughs> I work for a consultant I work for a consultancy company no? and uh, never pumasok sa isip namin na mag-claim kami for additional fees kasi we don't have a right uh, in the contract to claim for additional kasi lump sum yung lump sum hmm. yung contract lump sum, yeah, yeah. Uh, lump sum without any provision Christine. Hi Christine Hi sir uh, We are a consultancy firm uh Hindi naman kami nag uh, request ng ex- time extension. Um time extensions po hindi, but more on the, the cost claims arising from the extension of time. Uh monthly payment ba ang consultant niyo by monthly payment? Um ang payment po is based on the milestone of the construction contractor. Oh, so kung walang okay oh, so, he cannot kasi miles to POC, di ba? POC? Based on POC? Um, apo. Yes. yes. Oh, he cannot claim because wala siyang POC that time, di ba? Mm-hmm. Wala po. Yes. But here, uh, <laughs> ang argument yeah, na that's, would be... That's where I'm going to. That's where I'm going to. Kung milestones, kung hindi niya na-achieve yung miles, kung wala, kung milestone basis yung payment mo kay consultant, hanggat hindi na hanggat hindi na achieve the contractor yung milestone na yun, then there is no entitlement for payment so what if 10 years after pa yung niya ma achieve yung milestone na yun? so i don't think uh, you have a very good uh, the, the consultant has a very good legal foundation in terms of uh, seeking for additional payment lalo na kung milestones yeah, that's why i and, asked if it's monthly or by milestone risk, monthly risk or kasi ano yun eh. yes risk kasi ni, risk na ni consultant yan Nung, ano, nung, and they are very aware. They're yeah. experts yung mga consultants sa construction and I'm sure na mitigate na nila yan or nakasama na yan sa costs nila. It's just that maybe they're just asking for more. Another scenario po is what if we issued a slowdown kasi hindi rin namin alam financially kung ano magiging status ng project. What do you mean? What if we issued a slowdown for example from June to December? Kasi di ba mm-hmm. na-issue po yung lockdown okay. starting March up to May. And then by right. June, say we issued the slowdown. So a slowdown meaning uh, um, you imposed limitations? Mm-hmm. On the design. Design works. For example. The design work. Yeah. Kasi easy po yung contract eh. Um, Again, kung milestone dates, kung milestones din na naman, milestones din yung inyong payment claims, your entitlement for payment claim, then, sorry, hindi nyo pa, I mean, hindi nyo pa na-achieve yung milestone, so there's no entitlement for payment yet. No, no, wait, wait, but that's the, that's a different case because the proponent... Oh, it's a different case. The the proponent in si, uh, sinabi niya that there is a slowdown in the design phase. So the tendency is that the POC would be affected by the slowdown of the design phase. So that's... Uh, um, a clear uh, uh, conflict between the contract. Uh, so oh, there's, yeah. oh, I, I get it now. So there's, okay, I get it. Uh, but then again, you have to check your contract if you have a provision on that. Kung hindi, mm-hmm. or kung wala, absent any express provisions in the contract, then, oh. yeah, maybe you will be invited to the table for negotiation of revision of fees. Mm-hmm. Check your contract. Uh, it's very important. Yung mga consultancy contracts naman, siguro mga 10-15 pages lang yan. Thank you po for answering right. your question. Sure. Sir JC, another from Sir Raimundo. Okay. Another question, sir, related to position of site. What is your opinion on public works projects where the employer is neither in possession of site but the contractor insists that the employer failed to give possession? Oh, okay. So, kanino ba risk yung pagpo-possess ng site? Is it the risk of the employer or is it the risk of the contractor? Kasi without dif- without disclosing further details, no, meron ako na encounter uh, na ganyang case. Ang problema nila is uh, yung risk ni- yung risk ng clearing ng site is under the contractor. So, eh, yung site, madaming informal settlers. So, 
naghanap pa sila ng ways paano nila i-relocate yung mga settlers and stuff like that. So, it depends on whose risk it is. Uh, kung risk yan ni contractor or risk ba ni employer. And then from there, doon na magsistart yung determination ng entitlement for extension for failure to possess uh, failure to possess the site. Sir, what if yung risk A hindi na mag define sa contract? Meaning, uh, this specific uh, problem po encountered, hindi na man define sa contract as uh, risk ni employer, neither uh, risk ni contractor. Mm, then you have to look at your costs. May costs ba kayo uh, for, for the possession of site? If yes, if kasama yung site clearing or site preparation, stuff like that, then it's under your... Uh, I I would opine na uh, that would be under your uh, risk. Mm, okay. kasi it's not ex uh, expressly provided, no? Pero look at your cost. Look at the whole contract as the the whole contract. Uh, dun mo mar uh, then uh, you you interpret dif the different clauses, how they interact with each other, and then you will realize mo dun kung kanino yung risk ni contractor. Uh -huh. Actually, right, sir, risk ng site clearance. Ah, okay po. Actually, sir, mm -hmm. uh, further to this deed, ano po, uh, to this uh, problem po. Uh, ang interpretation po kasi namin bilang uh, the employer of the contract is that uh, the reason why we are requiring the contractor to secure first the permits from LGU before commencing the works is uh, to gain possession of the site nga po. So, ayun sir ang uh, ang aming argument with the contractor. However, the contractor insists po that uh, the uh, employer and contractor relationship under the contract, uh, hindi po siya, kumbaga, uh, ginagawa niya kasing two-sided, uh, two-sided sa pakoin eh. So meaning, sir, ang sinasabi po niya, eh, uh, under the contract po, the employer should uh, provide the contractor possession of site. Whereas kami naman po, ang opinion namin, uh, hindi nga po namin pagmamayari yung site, which is why nire-require namin sila na mag-apply ng permits. So ano so, po sir ang opinion nyo doon? Again, opinion. Apo. <laughs> so I, I think yung, yung, yung pwede mong i-deduce yung, yung question mo into two parts. Yung first part, sabi mo kanina, yung, uh, LG, uh, yung permits from the LGU is under the contractor's risk. And yes po permit acquisition is a part or condition precedent to acquisition of the site, correct? Or possession yeah. of the site. Yun sir ang establish po namin. Yeah. So if you're able to establish that, then that will be a good starting point for you para ipasa mo yung risk kay contractor. Kasi wala ka naman, I mean, andyan naman yung site, eh. pwede ka na mag-umpisa. It's just that di ka makapag-umpisa kasi wala ka pang permit. Yes, sir, sino yes, sino ba yung in-charge sa permit? Ikaw, si contractor. So, contractor, that will be your risk. Kung, kung, kung tama yung interpretation ko sa contract. So, you, you look at your contract. Tignan mo yung... Uh, tignan mo yung... Uh, how, how do I say it? Tignan mo yung mga provisions. Uh, on, especially sa preambles. Usually, nakasingit na sa preambles. If you have preambles to bills of quantities or sa specifications. May standard Copies. form of contract ba yan? Um, yung contract po namin ay based sa FIDIC. Pero hindi siya FIDIC? Uh, not necessarily FIDIC, yes. Ah, Alright, so you just have to check. Uh, you just have to check your contract. Pero kung yung sinasabi mo, condition precedent to the contractor commencing works on site is acquisition of permit from the LGU, then you have a good... Uh, uh, a, a, a good argument na, na risk nga ni contractor yung possession ng site. Copy, sir. Thank you, po. Okay. Okay, so another message, sir. So this is not actually a question. So from our dean, Joseph Cruz, congratulations, a very informative and productive seminar. So magaling si engineer Jose Carlo Padilla. Di siya selfish mag-share ng expertise. Thank you so much. My so, pleasure. galing po yan sa ating Dean, Sir uh, JC. It's my pleasure, uh, Dean. Then, another question po. Uh, marami sa mga ongoing project during this pandemic, may mga sariling protocol. One of these protocols is lockdown ang mga workers sa site. In other words, bawal lumabas. Then, yung mga owner supplied materials na delay so affected yung schedule ng contractor. 
tanong ko, pwede bang mag-claim ng additional cost si contractor in terms of labor cost? Again, uh, we'll go back to the reason, no? Kung reason ng disruption or reason ng uh, delay. Is it because of the employer or is it because of a neutral event? Yun yung ating base, uh, yun yung ating uh, starting point. No, so kung pandemic yan and may mga government orders, uh, executive orders or government issued instruments, uh, which has an effect of a law, then uh, unfortunately, walang ano, uh, it's very difficult. It will be challenging to establish an entitlement. Pero they can try. They can still argue uh, na they are entitled for the costs. If I may just share, no, Singapore, the government issued a legislation, cost sharing. So it's very clear. So it's very clear yung, yung costs incurred by the, um, by the uh, contractor and the uh, employer. So nakasulat doon ano yung pwede nila cost na i-share, ano yung cost na kay contractor lang. So it's very clear. So maybe if we, I, I'm not sure whether yung bayanihan uh, by any hand act covers this, but maybe you can check that one as well. Kung meron siyang uh, cost sharing or a clause to that effect. Okay, no more? Okay, kung wala na siguro, sir. It's time na na award na natin yung. Okay, so. Award, no? kung... Wala na pong uh, questions and clarification. So it's time to award the certificate to our uh, speaker. So let me share the screen. Okay. So citation, Republic of the Philippines, Nueva Ecija University of Science and Technology with uh, ISO certification 9001. 2015, Cabanatuan City, Nueva Ecija, Extension Services Department, Graduate School, and Just Construction and Management Consultants, awards the Certificate of Recognition to Engineer Jose Carlo Padilla for serving as speaker during the webinar series on construction management titled Contract Administration 101, conducted on September 25, 2021 by a Zoom meeting given this 25th day of September 2021 here at Cabanatuan City, Novicia. Signed, uh, Marvick N. Villegas, PhD, Director, Extension Services Department. Uh, Jocelyn B. Cruz, PhD, Dean, Graduate, of, uh, graduate School. Then, Engineer Feliciano P. Jacoba, EDD, SUC, President 3. So once again, Sir JC, thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, NEUSD Graduate School. Thank you, Joe Phil and Jet, for this opportunity uh, you've given me today. So it was very productive and uh gantong oras medyo nakakaanto kaya this is a very uh, lively conversation. Okay. All right, in behalf of the man, suggest or suggest the man, no? Okay. So here, no, a certificate of appreciation is also given. Just construction and man management consultants, uh, an ISO 9001 2015 certified company in construction management uh, has hereby awarded this, this, this uh, certification or certificate of appreciation to engineer Jose Carlo Padilla for sharing his... Uh, Great effort and valuable knowledge as a guest speaker during this construction webinar, construction management webinar series entitled Contract Administration 101, given this day, 25th day of September 2021, signed Dr. Joe C. Hoxon, President. Okay, thank you, JC. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time and if you have any more questions, <laughs> uh, you can visit my uh, LinkedIn uh, profile. Uh, you can we can connect there. And, yeah. uh, you need clarifications, just message me there. Okay. 
din uh, baka po may gusto po kayong uh, sabihin. Okay. Wala na, overwhelm ako kasi napaka-productive, daming na na-solve na problema ni Engineer JC. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> With that, ano, we can lessen the issues ano, in contracting uh, and having the, the construction contract. Kasi malimit talaga, maraming issues dyan. Eh, no? yes. yeah. So yan ang role ng just construction. Consultant yeah. and also the JC, Engineer JC. Thank you so much.